All right, according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, welcome back. Good to have you with us today. Um, I was just thinking if we have a schedule announcement to make. No, we don't. We're going to continue doing uh, this all through. Uh, the Schaefer Conference is next week, but that's not going to impact uh, our Sunday schedule at all. So uh, we'll be able to proceed on that basis. God is spirit. He must be worshiped in spirit and in truth. In preparation for our study of the word of God, let's go to him in prayer, asking for his blessing on our time of study. Shall we pray? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the privilege and blessing that it is for us to assemble together. I thank you for these students. I thank you for their faithfulness. And I pray for diligence as we continue studying and searching the scriptures to see if these things are so. I thank you, Father, and I praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, so this is uh, week two. Last week, we gave an introduction and gave the material kind of an overview for what the Ryrie book is all about. Also mentioned other authors like uh, Schaefer and Schofield and, and uh, Larkin in particular, the great diagrams and charts that you find in the Clarence Larkin material. I also found a couple new ones, new to me anyway, uh, in because of the Ryrie chapter, and I'll share some of those with you today as well as we work our way through. Um, so today we're going to cover chapter 1, pages 13 to 24. It's 12 pages, one of the shorter readings, maybe almost the shortest reading that we're going to have the entire time. Um, and you can kind of see the schedule there. By the time we get to May 12th and May 19th, I might just go ahead and combine those. Um, chapter 11 is 12 pages. Chapter 12 is, is six pages. Uh, I, I haven't decided yet if we should just lump them together into an 18-page uh, reading. Uh, it's probably worth, even though it's six pages, they're good pages. And in the final plea is very reasonable, and I, I would like to maybe spend some time on that. So between now and May, I'll have to figure out, i got time, uh, what we're going to do with those final chapters. Also, I posted this schedule in the church app in the group, so you're going to see it there. If you scroll up, you'll find it there, and you can save it if you want a local copy. Um, just be uh, aware of when you're looking at all those Sundays there that there is a jump from April 7th to April 21st, and so there's actually a Sunday, uh, Sunday March, f or April 14th, where we will not have a class. So uh, you'll have an extra week to read the uh, Chapter 8 material there on, uh, on that. So just kind of... I'll remind you as we get closer to, to that date, but uh, I will not be uh, there. I will not be in town on uh, April the, uh, the 14th, so stay tuned on that. All right, did you read the chapter? Right hand means yes, you read it, yes, you read it. Outstanding. All right, did you not read the chapter? All right, and I have two people that didn't raise either hand, so we'll figure that out too. All right, we'll just assume it's a left hand didn't read the chapter. Okay. Honest. We'll give you points for honesty. Um, it's a good chapter. It's a short chapter. Uh, it's, an, it's an aggravating chapter based upon some of the, uh, the bad things that are said in this chapter uh, by some of the characters and people that we're introduced to here. I just want to kind of run through it top to bottom. I'm going to handle this like we do typically on a, on a uh, Geisler type of week. We'll just, I'm going to skim through the pages. I'm going to highlight the things that have already been highlighted uh, that will jump out at me. And if I, if I skip by something, that you had highlighted or that jumped out at you, if I get past that point, feel free to raise your hand and let me know. Uh, do we have the microphone already retrieved? And re We do. All right. So we'll be ready to handle that. So dispensationalism, is it a help or is it a heresy? Okay. And uh, I would say it's a help. But uh, there are plenty of other people, um, many of them named in this chapter, who would say it's a heresy, right? It's the worst thing that ever happened. And one of my newest books on dispensationalism is on how uh, terminal it is and how uh, the rise and fall of dispensationalism. And that thankfully, over the next 30 years, it's going to die out and go extinct, and no one will ever teach it ever again. <coughs> and the author was very excited about that as a, uh, as a possibility. So um, anyway... I feel like quoting Mark Twain as saying that the reports of our demise are, are exaggerated. But um, anyway, when you say the word, you're going to, uh, you're going to engender a response, and so, oftentimes it's positive. For others, it's very negative. I did like this opening paragraph here when he speaks about the fondness. Um, it brings back good memories for the help and the blessing. 
ministries and writings and conferences especially. Um, the, the dispensational circles have always been heavy on conferences. And the Niagara Bible Conference and, and others are just legendary for uh, the productivity that those conferences had back in the day. And even today, when we still have conferences today, the, the Schaefer Conference, the Pre-Trib Conference, these are very much in the tradition of those old Niagara Bible Conferences. And so there's a lot of fondness for those memories. For others, however, dispensationalism is something to be avoided like the plague. Perhaps they do not even begin to understand what it is, but if they've heard about it, they know it's bad. They've heard about it in a negative way. It has to be bad. They've been told that it's heretical, and uh, you, you can't even be friends with a dispensationalist because they're probably not even safe. Maybe they don't take it that far, but they are very hostile to, uh, to that. All right, question already. Is the microphone on at the, uh, the button back there? See, we're just testing the microphone. Okay. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Right. Okay, cool. So uh, I actually have a question. Uh, the, the Niagara conferences, can you elaborate on that a little bit? I'm kind of curious on some of the history of dispensationalism here. What, what, what's yeah, that well, all about? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll show you where to pull that up. Perfect. Okay. <clears throat> Early 20th century, late, 18, late 19th century. And I'm pretty sure there's an article in the fact book on Niagara Bible. Oh, maybe not. I'll find an article for you and send that to you. Yeah, because a lot of the early dispensationalists, they really transcended dispensational boundaries. And you had guys that were Presbyterians, guys that were Congregationalists, guys that were Baptists, guys that were Lutheran even. Can you believe that? And they would come together in these conferences, and they were really interdenominational, um, non-denominational Bible teaching conferences. And uh, they, they went on for years. They would have these annual conferences. So very much part of our heritage. All right, then uh, this jumped out at me. So I highlighted it, and I colored it, and I made it bigger. Like all doctrines, dispensational teaching has undergone systemization and development in its lifetime, though the basic tenets have not changed. And you can say that about many, many different doctrinal belief systems. In fact, you know, Calvinism is a good example uh, because of the, the systemization and the development over time starting with Calvin, but then getting to the Synod of Dort, and then beyond the Synod of Dort into today's Neo-Calvinist, um, there has been a, a significant systemization and development. That's not a bad thing. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a very good thing, and we're happy that that happens. And, uh, and as it happens, the things get tweaked, things get improved, things that were more problematic the way they were described earlier can be remedied and can be uh, d uh, dealt with. If, um, if you're not fair to that view, though, and you keep insisting on going back to an earlier statement and then making that your, your uh, straw man argument, then you're actually misrepresenting the case. And we'll, we'll discuss why, that, why that's not legitimate. So um, anyway, systemization and development in its lifetime. And, and its lifetime is more than you think it is. Its lifetime does not actually start with Darby. Okay, Darby did a significant amount of systemization and development, but dispensationalism is older than Darby in, uh, in the core tenets, and, and that will be demonstrated as well. Oftentimes it's been uh, attacked. Caricatures and stereotypes misrepresent. Even back in 1965, when Ryrie wrote his original text on this, he was trying to overcome some of the, uh, the misrepresentations and the ugly uh, nature of, of the critics. And, and he's not changing that with this edition. This edition adds more information, it updates things, includes the, the progressive dispensationalism things that started in the early 90s, and, uh, but he does not change or dilute or minimize the basic teachings of normative or classic dispensationalism. And, and anytime you hear normative or classic, essentially you're thinking uh, Schofield, Schaefer, Ryrie. Okay? That's kind of the normative, classic route that dispensationalism uh, has gone. Um, well, we'll say some more about that, because there were earlier dispensationalists than Schofield, and even some contemporaries like uh, Larkin and, and other guys that uh, were even later than Schofield. Uh, we'll see some of those guys today. Scroggins is one that I'm going to bring up today. W. Graham Scroggins wrote, he was later than Schofield, but he had his own independent outline that did not, was not dependent on Schofield's model. 
All right. Uh, dispensationalists or conservative evangelical Christians? <laughs> it would be good. This reminder needs to go to the other side. Just to remember, we're not the enemy here. Okay. Um, Many of the differences of opinion discussed in this book are between evangelicals with whom there is agreement in many other important areas of doctrine, okay? And I would say the same thing. I, I, I try to be more gracious than, than I need to be, maybe. I try to be more gracious with, um, with Calvinists. I try to be more gracious with lordship guys. I want to be more gracious with covenant guys. I certainly want to be more gracious than they will be with me. Uh, but just to say, look, we're, we're, we're believers, we're saved, we're going to be in heaven forever. And, uh, and just relax about the stuff they, they, they don't have right, okay? I'm not here to fix them. They're not here to fix me. We're just serving the Lord, and uh, we can appreciate that. So uh, this is his disclaimer on this, and I appreciate it for what it says. Uh, we should discuss differences in factual, fair, and clear, and in a spirit of helpfulness. It's not good to put up a straw man and beat it up. It's not fair. It's not right. It's not even Christian. Why, why are you doing that, Okay. And I hope that every reader, before putting the book down, will read the last chapter, no matter how mildly or violently he or she may disagree with other parts of the book. And that'd be great. If you hate the first, uh, if you hate everything up through chapter 12, just read chapter 12, okay? And before you walk away, before you put it down. And it's, uh, it's a good call. Now, starting on page 14, he starts to run through various enemies, various, uh, if you don't like the word enemy, then various opponents, theological opponents to dispensationalism. The opposition comes from a lot of places, and the attacks have been quite varied. First of all, we start with a theological liberal, and you guys are equipped for this greatly because of what we saw not long ago in Geisler, right? We went through the history of, of uh, uh, in Prolegomena. We went through in Bibliology. We've seen we, the theological liberals. We've seen the neoliberals. We've seen the or neo-orthodox. We've seen the evangelicals. We've seen all of these different eras within uh, recent church history. And so, you know, the theological liberal, they've got bigger issues than dispensationalism that's problematic, okay? And so, um, yeah, quite naturally they oppose dispensationalism because, honestly, they oppose a lot of our biblical approach. They don't think the Bible is what we say it is, what the Bible says it is, okay? He finds completely unpalatable its plain interpretation based on a verbal plenary view of inspiration of Scripture. And on that basis, he disagrees with a whole host of other beliefs that we hold in common with other conservatives. So, yeah, the theological liberals, they're going to be anti-dispensational, but that's, that's really a small part of their, their anti-biblical, the way we hold to the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture. But then within conservatives, okay, and when we're talking about our covenant friends, when we're talking about our lordship friends, when we're talking about uh, others, I mean, John MacArthur, for example, he is a dispensationalist still, uh, even though he's kind of changed in, in certain realms. Um, but you can't say that they're liberals. MacArthur's not a liberal. Sproul's not a liberal. Uh, Packer's not a liberal, okay? Uh, they are conservatives. They, they hold uh, the inspiration of Scripture. They're born again, even if they don't have their own assurance. We can have assurance for them. They're born again. All right. Now, within the conservative circles, what do we do with these all millennialist guys? Okay? Or what do they do with us? I guess that's the, the fairer question. So you have an all millennialist. This would be Roman Catholics, this would be Lutherans, this would be a whole lot of, you know, covenant all mill uh, covenant all mill guys, okay? There is no millennium. There, there's just I mean, we're here already. The kingdom is here. Okay? Uh, dispensationalists are invariably premillennialist, and so because we're premillennialists, they dislike us for that reason. Their teaching cannot be a viable option since premillennialism and amillennialism do not mix. And here's the example of A.W. Pink. And I don't know if I have... Yes, I went ahead and I created the full quote in context there. If you want to read it related to Pink, there might be a, full, a fuller thing there. It, it, when you have the opportunity to look at the quote, look at the larger context, look at the surrounding material leading up to that quote, and you get a better sense that, okay, um, actually, this is good. This is representative. This is fair. It's not cherry-picking. It's not... Sometimes you can take a quote and so minimalize it that you, you make it say the opposite of what it should be saying, and that's, uh, that's tragic. But here's what Pink says. Uh, he writes of dispensationalists as those who impose their crudities and vagarities. Right? 
Okay, so you see where this is going. It's not starting off very positive, but tell me about my crudities and my vagarities and make their poor dupes, that's you guys, okay, makes their poor dupes believe in a wonderful discovery has been made in the rightly dividing the word of truth. How dreadfully superficial and faulty their findings are, you know, scare quotes, findings, um, is apparent from the popular Schofield Bible. And he says, far too popular, far too popular to be of much value. And uses Luke 16 as the authority for that. That if something's popular, you know it's from Satan. Okay? So, uh, Luke 16, 15, as Jesus says to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. Okay? So if it has a popular following, like the Schofield Bible, then clearly it's not from God. And this is the proof text. Anyway, um, I did go and get the fuller quote on that, and it, he does say what, and he says even more. Um, yeah. Because <laughs> he talks about the ignorance and obscurity. So during the palmy days of the Puritans, considerable attention was given to the subject of the covenants as their writings, events, particularly the works of Usher, Witsius, Blake, and Boston. But alas, alas, with the exception of a few high Calvinists, their massive volumes fell into general neglect until a generation arose who had no light thereon. This made it easier for certain men to impose upon them the crudities and vagarities and make their poor dupes believe a wonderful discovery had been made in rightly dividing the word of truth. These men shuffled scriptures until they arranged the passages treating the covenants to arbitrarily divide time into seven dispensations and partition off the Bible accordingly. How dreadfully superficial and faulty their findings are, are, are appear from the popular, far too popular to be of much value, Schofield Bible, where no less than eight covenants are noticed and nothing is said about the everlasting covenant, which that's a big deal in covenant theology, okay? If some think we have exaggerated the ignorance that which now obtains upon this subject, let them put the following questions to the best informed Christian friends and see how many can give a satisfactory answers. And so he goes on to other things there. But anyway, that's pink writing against um, dispensationalism. More recently, John Gerstner labeled dispensationalism a cult and not a branch of the Christian church, associating dispensationalists with false teachers and heretics. All right, and you got the quote on that. So obviously from all mill types, uh, we're not going to be acceptable. On the other hand, you got ultra dispensationalists. We talked about those, the Bollingerites and the Acts 9 crowd and, uh, and those guys. They feel that normative dispensationalists have not gone far enough in their teachings, and thus are unbiblical in their conclusions, which therefore must be rejected. And so if you run into some of those guys, uh, they're not going to like you either until you convert to their uh, hyper-dispensationalism. Also, covenant premill. Opposition has been developed from those who are premillennial, but not dispensational. Generally, they are covenant premillennials who believe in a post-tribulational rapture. Their point is that dispensational premillennialism is not historical, but that, so they're willing to accept that. They're fine with the premillennialism part, just not the dispensational premillennialism. Um, anyway, so their attack is going to center on those distinctions. Present upsurge of historical premillennialism has challenged the dispensational theory of a pre-tribulational rapture of the church out of the world. They believe it's gone. Okay? Belief in a pre-tribulational rapture is a deviation one that will hopefully be gone and people will quit having rapture uh, classes. Anyway, these guys are, are very, you know, they, 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 they're just gloating over our demise as if it's already accomplished. Various attacks range from mild to severe. Here's Philip Morrow. Here's the thing. He used to be pre-mill and then he abandoned his dispensational childhood. And, uh, and he's got a, He's got a sad quote there as well, calling it the leaven. Evangelical Christianity must purge itself of this leaven of dispensationalism before it can display its former power and exert its former influence. I'd, I really want to sit down with him and, and have him describe for me these glory days of the, the former uh, power and uh, influence of 
this uh, utopian evangelicalism that he thinks was there. The entire system of dispensational teaching is modernistic in the strictest sense. Uh, Oswald Alice, slightly more mild, said that dispensationalism is, is a danger and is unscriptural. Daniel Fuller, you ever heard of Fuller Seminary? Okay, reached a similar conclusion. The dispensationalism internally inconsistent and unable to harmonize itself with biblical data. Really? And uh, tell me more. Anyway, there's this footnote, and you can read the, the uh, material there. THD dissertation for Northern Baptist Theological Seminary. John Bowman. Practically unrestrained attack on the original Schofield Bible and its dispensational teaching said this book represents perhaps the most dangerous heresy currently to be found within Christian circles. The most I'm sorry? The most That's it, yeah. Uh, that. Yeah, we're very dangerous. The, uh, the Presbyterian Journal was slightly kinder and actually was, uh, th there's no name attached to this, but the editor of the Presbyterian Journal, at least he acknowledged that it's conservative so we're a conservative heresy? Okay, <laughs> thanks for the conservative part. Whatever else you may say about dispensationalists, one thing you can say about him with great assurance, he is conservative in theology. All right, thanks. I can, I'll, I'll take that. I'm a conservative heretic. You also have reconstructionists, okay? If you know uh, some of these names, Rush Dooney or, or uh, some of these other guys, okay? Christian dominionists. And uh, one of whom even lives here in this town, uh, the son-in-law of, I'm forgetting his name now. Anyway, um, Dominion theologians, theonomists, these are the guys that kind of want to bring back Mosaic law and cause it to be uh, governing over America. That, that you know, if we're going to be blessed by God, then we need to become a, a theocracy ourselves and follow Mosaic law in our, uh, in our uh, secular laws. Anyway, here's Rush Dooney. Rusus Rush Dooney is his name. Theonomy and Christian Ethics. And these are the guys, by the way, that when the, when the liberals at uh, wherever, CNN, whatever the media outlet, they will accuse us of doing what those guys are doing, that, that we're trying to bring in a theocracy, okay? No, we're not. Rush Dooney and those guys are, but not us. That's not, our, uh, that's not our shtick. Others label premillennialism as an unorthodox teaching generally espoused by heretical sects on the fringes of the Christian church. So a lot of this, I mean, it's just ad hominem, it's just name calling, it's just dismissive. Um, and, and if they say it often enough, their people are just going to say, okay, well, that makes sense. And, and they're not going to look into it. And it's like when, uh, when somebody writes a book and says, oh, Zane Hodges preaches a crossless gospel and oh, you just panic over what, you don't really look into it and you don't read it. And, uh, and all the rest. So are we heretics? Are we fringe? What are we? Labeling us as modernistic, unscriptural, heresy. It's not the only way it's been attacked. There's other uh, guilt by association methods that are employed. Bowman associates dispensationalism with names like Hitler, National Socialism, Roman Catholicism, Christian Science, and Mormonism. Okay? What do these things all have in common? Just nothing. Just... Uh, they're, they're, they're bad. Okay. A book called The Church Faces the Isms. And uh, dispensationalism gets lumped in there with Seventh-day Adventism and perfectionism. Gerstner. What's kind of interesting, he, he at least has to acknowledge that we're not Mormons and we're not Jehovah's Witnesses, but he wants to call us that. Puts us, uh, in certain respects, alongside Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. In a foreword to Gerstner's book, R.C. Sproul draws an analogy between dispensationalists and Joseph Fletcher, the father of modern situational ethics. So you have those, uh, the unfair associations. Then there's the ad hominem, based on character. I mean, don't you know, of uh, the character flaws of Darby, the character flaws of Schofield. I mean, Schofield was a drunk. Can you believe it? And, um, right. So most often singled out is J.N. Darby, John Nelson Darby. And the point of the attack is usually his separationist principles and practices, pictured as the Pope, that he was a tyrannical uh, church leader, that he didn't uh, tolerate uh, arguments and all the rest. Uh, the Pope of the Plymouth Brethren movement who excommunicated at will 
those who disagreed with him and whose separationist practices have characterized the entire dispensational movement for, for ill. Now, admittedly, okay, yeah. There were different sects of, of brethren and there were different um, um, sects, S-E-C-T-S, and there were different uh, uh, kinds of, of brethren and, and some that were, that were not pleased with Nelson's uh, style or Darby's style. So to illustrate, there exists a direct line from Darby through a number of channels, all characterized by and contributing to a spirit of separation and exclusion. The devastating effects of this spirit upon the total body of Christ cannot be underestimated. And it's interesting. I mean, yes, there are exclusionary churches out there. They are the fundamentalists. I think there's a lot of very ugly uh, ministries that are out there. But uh, the dispensationalists I'm aware of aren't in this crowd. That's the thing. It's, uh, you know, we're small enough, we don't drive people away. <laughs> yeah, we're happy to have anyone that wants to come in and study the Word of God. Okay? Pointing to cases in which division of the churches was involved with dispensational teaching. And that always gets me too. Oh, well, it's divisive. It's divisive. You dispensationalists are divisive. And yet you look at it on a case-by-case -case basis and you ask yourself, who was causing the divisiveness? Who was, was it the dispensationalists or was it the critics that were trying to end it? Or what was it that sparked the fight? Or how did that work? Or tell me more. But really, and that just becomes a red herring anyway, because um, you can apply that to anything and then say, well, we can't have any theological discussion. And how do we discuss anything without having some that view this and some that view that? And we, we work it out. The intellectual attack. Uh, somebody noted, in the process of earning a doctor's degree, that's what rescued them. That's what delivered them from dispensational teaching that he grew up with. That, yeah, I used to be a dispensationalist. This was Bass. Backgrounds into dispensationalism. He grew up with this. It was his part of his childhood, part of his training. Thank goodness he got off to seminary and they, they fixed him. They got it all worked out. Obviously, as Ryrie says, there are men with PhDs who support the dispensational approach. And yet, the, the, those attacks don't stop. And it's just, why? Why are you doing that? Unworthy as it may be, the attack is a powerful one. It implies that whereas dispensationalism is something that may inadvertently be learned in Sunday school or at Bible school, greater intellectual maturity will certainly lead to its abandonment. And there really was a, a sense of, of um, superiority and... and, and the Bible conferences were ridiculed. The Bible colleges were ridiculed. Uh, Moody was ridiculed. All the, uh, the Philadelphia College of the Bible, the Moody Bible Institute, uh, Biola, all these Bible institutes were viewed as being cute, but not really uh, of the level of, of uh, Oxford and Cambridge and, and Harvard and, and all of the preeminent uh, schools of their day. And, and some of that rubs off. Dallas was mocked for decades. And, uh, and, and they struggled and they struggled. And then in the 1970s, they obtained their... You know, they dreamed about having accreditation. They dreamed about having to stand among their peers. To me, that was just a sad, it was like Israel demanding a king. I want to be a king like all the nations around us. Uh, why do you want to stand among your peers? You have no peers. You're already head and shoulders above those, uh, those uh, reprobate schools. So anyway, I'll get off that soapbox here in a moment. But it's an intellectual attack, Okay. Uh, and, and Walford and Ryrie and Schofield and uh, Schaefer, all these guys, um, they didn't have accredited degrees. And they're some of the, the great hero uh, theologians of the 20th century. So uh, Dallas did not need to get accredited, and I'm kind of sad they did. The historical attack. Well, you know, it was just made up by Derby, or he got it from a demoniac girl, or something like that. It's, it's something brand new to the 19th century. It was never taught for uh, 18 centuries of the church. That's uh, the subject of chapter four is going to tear that to shreds. And then we'll give additional authors and additional books as well. William Watson on dispensationalism before Darby and uh, plenty of other examples there as well. The ridicule of doctrine attack. Straw man construction of uh, something in a dispensationalist said 100 years ago. And so, um, yeah, here's the example that he gives here. Um, Obviously, don't you know dispensationalists teach two or more different ways to get saved? Which we don't. But poorly communicated dispensationalists of 100 years ago 
didn't write with uh, the same clarity that we appreciate today. And you can, uh, you can cherry pick some quotes here and there to think that this is the case when it's not. Um, but then they throw it out there. It's teaching two or more ways of salvation. What could be more unscriptural than that? And so by ridiculing something they find problematic, then they can just dismiss the whole thing. Uh-huh. <laughs> Microphone. So, uh, to that statement, two ways of, of being safe or more, um, what could they be? That the, the concept that in, in the age of grace, we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, but that Israel in the Old Testament got saved by keeping the law which no dispensationalist said that. Mm. Um, there is a, a, an unfortunate quote from Schaefer that approaches that, but that's not at all what he meant by it. And yeah, not an issue. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. The non-dispensationalist usually finds eschatological factors least important. That's another, th another thing, too. Why are you so wrapped up about prophecy? We have hurting people. We need to teach things now that help people's lives now. We need, to, you know, we, need, uh, we need church to be here and now for pressing needs. And, uh, and, and even dismissing that there's any value to studying eschatology. And then they'll, they'll actually kind of amplify that even more. Evidently, the dispensationalist feels that our church creeds are inadequate because they do not include pronouncements on such matters as pre-tribulation or rapture or the identification of the 144,000. I mean, it's just stupid stuff. I love this quote, my favorite in the whole chapter, when Ryrie is talking about Bruce Walkie. He says, formerly a dispensationalist, now an amillennialist, and always a friend. I thought that was very well stated. And, and, and I use Walkie. I, I use... Um, uh, he's got a commentary on Proverbs that's just off the charts, excellent. He's got other material. Um, yeah. It's, it's sad that he went the direction that he went. But in a lecture given in 1991, predicted, hey, that's when I started seminary, predicted that dispensationalism has no future as a system. He went on to say that unless a new accredited theologian arises to defend historic dispensationalism, this aberration in Christian theology will die. It will die. He was convinced of that. All right. So I guess my question about this particularly, like for Bruce um, Waltke, right? Uh -huh. <clears throat> my, I guess my question for him is why does, why does someone that's accredited have to defend it in order for it to be true? Oh, uh -huh. done. But yeah, I see what you're saying there. Yeah, no, he, yeah, he, He's convinced it's not true and that it's going to stop being taught anywhere. And I imagine he was greatly encouraged by the direction also in 1991 or 1992 when uh, Dallas started to go to the progressive uh, side of things. And so when Bach and, and Blazing wrote progressive dispensationalism, it was right the same 1991-1992 time frame that uh, it seemed like that if, if DTS is changing their structure, then, you know, Katie barred the door, right? It's almost like, so. The, um, what's the other one I have? Rise and fall of uh, dispensationalism. There it is. Daniel G. Hummel. The rise and fall of dispensationalism. How the evangelical battle over the end times shaped a nation. And it's, um, it's actually a pretty good book for what it tries to do. Uh, which means it's, it's horrible for what it actually accomplishes, and uh, brings up all the myths of Darby, and, and, but it also provides information in there on, um, on Hal Lindsey that I learned a lot from and other things. So anyway, but that's another one of the chicken little uh, sky is falling, dispensationalism is doomed kind of authors. And, and he's apparently, he's, uh, he's being well received uh, by virtue of all the YouTube interviews I see that he's getting in, uh, in different places. So... Um, Anyway, the new progressive dispensationalism will come up in chapter 9, posing as a legitimate development. And again, I want to go back to that first quote. 
There has been lengthy systemization and, and, and categorization that needs to happen, that needs to keep happening. We don't want to stop that. But progressive dispensationalism is not that. It's actually a surrender and a departure and a betrayal. It is not a refinement or a systemization. So, um, and I will insist upon that as we, as we discuss it when we get into chapter 9. So, um, the ultimate test of any truth is whether it's in accord with reality, okay? Not who teaches it or, or what school teaches it. Is it true? So if dispensationalism has been called everything from a dangerous friend to a sworn enemy, is there any point of in examining it? If it's that dangerous, why look at it? And what do dispensationalists say for themselves that could make their teaching worth investigating? Could there be some help in that which is a heresy in the minds of some? So what value is there in it? Is there any value in it or do you just dump it and, and, and uh, change churches accordingly? <laughs> okay. Is there any value in it? And there's a lot of value in it. And, and I think first and foremost, what I'm going to stress is, and he goes into several helps here, uh, and I think he makes this case well. Ryrie spells it out, the value of a dispensational framework. But here's the thing. I will, I will use words like framework. I will use words like structure. I, I'm trying to find phrases. Maybe Ryrie's not using them, but it's useful to find a, uh, a grid or a framework or a, a skeleton, something that helps you in in forming an overall view of the Bible, right? And so we have, because the Bible itself does not give that to us, just like the Bible does not give us a systematic theology. And so we, we develop the systematic theology through the inductive study of the Bible passages, and, uh, and then we put them together in a systematic way. So systematizing and classifying and categorizing, all of these, it's not a weird thing to do. Theologians constantly do this, been doing this forever, we'll keep doing this forever. And, and so dispensationalists, uh, the, the system of dispensationalism is the result. It's the result of a literal hermeneutic applied to every realm of doctrine, including and especially the eschatological realm. Okay? The reformers didn't do that. They, they put the literal hermeneutic on the soteriology. Not until uh, later was the literal hermeneutic turned to the eschatological. All right. So as a framework, dispensationalism or other uh, theological frameworks, what do you do to guard against allowing the framework that has been derived from Scripture to mm -hmm. become a lens through which to interpret the Scripture? Yes. Great question. And, and this is vital. So you don't confuse the framework with the hermeneutic that produced the framework. And so that, that requires every passage you look at, you look at with a fresh set, a fresh set of eyes, you look at without the framework, you look at without, you look at it just on the basis of the text itself. And then you examine it on, the, on that basis, you exegete, you apply your hermeneutic, you come to all these conclusions. Only when you're done with that, then you say, okay, now, that being done, how does it fit into that framework? And so it's a last step, not a first step. And so it doesn't color how you look at it, but it adds the flavoring once it's, been, once it's been looked at. Does that make sense? Okay. And so again and again and again, uh, some of the biggest interpretive issues and some of the biggest uh, hermeneutical issues when you're using a plain language hermeneutic is that um, you read the word Israel, what does that mean? You read the word church, what does that mean? And you consistently, if you have consistent classifications for Gentiles, Jews, and church, uh, then invariably, with that consistent hermeneutic, you become a dispensationalist because that hermeneutic takes you there every time in, uh, in that sense. Okay, question? Okay, microphone over there. Someday, our church will grow to the point we can afford two microphones. I just, just want to make Jeremiah... Robbie Dean has two microphones, and I always feel jealous when... I just want to uh, make Jeremiah work. Yeah, that's true. No. So with uh, what Ruben said... And, and you said the flavor, but I, would this be a good analogy? You, you look into the text, you use the hermeneutics, the, the text, the categories, everything that you use as, as resource and, and tools, and then you bring out uh, the color of it, and then you categorize where that color is. If it's, it's some sort of shade, I don't, know, I don't know the categories of colors, but then that's where you would 
categorize it after after extracting the information and and then in in a sense you know what color coloring representing you know what dispensation it would fall under yeah i think if, if when you, you you know how you can make up a, a color with different colors and, and so um you know if you want to use if you want to create green you use blue and, and yellow and then uh -huh. create green if you want purple you introduce red and then you get purple to those three colors and and uh purple is good yeah <laughs> so it's, it's it's blue yellow and green and red and okay. then you get purple and then so by looking into the text into the into the bible and using the tools that we have uh using the hermeneutics the exegesis the the categories mm -hmm. and and uh in in a sense well you you mentioned flavor but I, I was saying you know you get a color out of it and then you you place that color into the categories where it belongs and meaning it, what dispensation it belongs i don't i was just trying to think of that but i i guess i can't yeah just hold on to that i think um, maybe not in this chapter, but the next chapter and chapter three, I think some of that will start to be addressed. Okay. All right, so here's some benefits. It answers the need of biblical distinctions. And so um, I think this heading is, is important. No interpreter of the Bible who does not recognize the need for certain basic distinctions in the scriptures. And, and until we reach the point of postmodernism where we totally deconstructed all language, this was just considered normal, right? This is just considered thinking. A is not, not A, okay? And you just start to, uh, you realize male and female, he created them. And you just, from the very beginning of chapter one, you've got these distinctions. And you don't really, they're not arguable, they're not debatable. You just, male and female, okay, those are my classifications. And you start taking the plain language of what Bible says. There's Jew and Gentile. Who are they, right? And if, if, the, if the Gentile is anybody that's not a Jew, then again, we got A and not A, and we got, these are just basic boundaries and basic classifications, and it shouldn't be that complicated. And, and so um, I think dispensationalism comes out of that when people use the literal hermeneutic to keep those distinctions in place and not allow for things to be blurred or made fuzzy like Israel and the church. You blur those, you make them fuzzy. Uh, the only way you can blur those and make them fuzzy is to abandon the literal hermeneutic in every passage where the distinction should be maintained. So the theological liberal, no matter how much he speaks of the Judaic background of Christianity, recognizes that Christianity is nevertheless different from Judaism. There may be many few or many features of Judaism in his mind carry over, but still the message of Jesus was something new. Therefore, the material of the Old Testament is distinguished from that of the New. One thing that this description falls short in is that even in Judaism, post-biblical Judaism is totally different than pre-Christian Judaism by virtue of the fact, not because Christianity has come on the scene, but because the temple was destroyed, that they no longer had their temple, they no longer had their, their functioning priesthood, they no longer had the, uh, the capacity there to do what they did uh, with a standing temple and with a functioning priesthood. So post-Christian uh, uh, Judaism ha made an adjustment anyway, which they would have made with or without Christianity being on the planet, see? So some of that needs to go into it too. Some of our discussions on Judaism are actually misguided because we're talking about uh, Talmudic Judaism as opposed to pre-Christian uh, Judaism. Sorry? Yeah. Mosaity. Mosaity. All right. So yeah, we have, the, we have the Christian way of life. They have the Mosaic way of life under Mosaity. All right. Covenant theologian, for all his opposition to dispensationalism, also makes certain rather important distinctions, okay? And, and they, they, they carry it this far, which gives us an opportunity to say, okay, um, can you take the next step, okay? Because you will acknowledge that nobody brought a goat this afternoon. Well, you will acknowledge that Christ is the end of the law for all who believe. So um, you're, you're almost there, okay? 
And, and the covenant guys are close, but no cigar, okay? So, um, so rather important distinctions. However, it must be noted his dispensational distinctives are viewed as related to the unifying and underlying covenant of grace. Taking it back to this artificial framework, the covenant of grace, uh, the, uh, do you have a question at the desk? Okay. I saw a raised hand. Okay, this is from Wes. Uh huh. Is and I don't. I just wanted to make sure it's in the right context. I'm not sure. Um, but is whether people believe the Sermon on the Mount was directed towards the Jewish people, or the church, the main cause of dissent between dispensationalists or covenant believers? Yeah, that passage gets used a lot. Um, again, because of ways that certain dispensationalists in in previous generations phrase things not as not as uh, optimally as perhaps they could have. Um, yeah, so that becomes a battlefield. And, and part of what the criticism against us is that we, we hate it or we ignore it or we don't use it or we, we just write it off and say, well, that's not for us and we pretend it's not there, uh, which we don't do, right? It is there, uh, but we have to interpret it accordingly. And when we do make our applications, we always approach it on a secondary basis, not a primary basis. And, and we're still uh, accountable for that which has been given. So uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount is, is one of the, the battlegrounds that will be very easily used to be able to determine if somebody's approaching it from a, a dispensational standpoint or a covenant standpoint. So, that, so he's, he's correct on that. Okay? All right, so uh, we we're about to get to the Louis Burkhoff quote here. Um, because he does make distinctions after he rejects the usual. And I have Burkhoff. I read Burkhoff. And, and I read Burkhoff before I knew who he was or what his theology was like. Um, so after uh, rejecting the usual dispensational scheme of Bible distinctions, he enumerates his own scheme of dispensations or administrations, uh, reducing the number to two. The Old Testament dispensation and the New Testament dispensation. And, and it's helpful, of course, that you have a printed Bible that seems to be broken up into testaments. And so um, you can do that. Okay, start with that. And then take it the next step. Just start with that and tell me, what other distinctions do you draw? Well, if that was then and this is now, then, you know, delineate this further. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. If, in fact, uh, the first step you took was legitimate, why not the second step? Um, within the Old Testament dispensation, Burkhoff lists four subdivisions. Um, he calls them stages in the revelation of the covenant of grace. Which, again, I'm trying to find a text that reveals the covenant of grace, but we'll let them pretend it's there. And then they have this stages of, in the revelation. And they're distinguishable enough to be listed. So if they're distinguishable enough to be listed, then they're distinguishable characteristics, which is all we're saying when we differentiate our dispensations and our ages, we're finding the distinguishable characteristics. Why was promise different than law? Even though Israel was the steward in both ages, right? From Adam and Moses, Israel was the steward, but they were under promise. From Moses to Jesus, they're under law, but Israel is still the steward, Age of promise, age of law, and then the age of the incarnation. While Jesus walked this earth, were there distinguishable characteristics? But Israel is still the steward. So you have subdivisions within the stewardships, within the economies, within the governance. Israel's governance began with Abraham, and it is not concluded yet. It will resume when the church is gone. That governance is, um, has had several different ages subdivisions within the overall stewardship. Same thing with, with humanity. They had an age of innocence, an age of conscience, an age of human government. Anyway, we're going to talk about those uh, as well. So Burkhoff listed these four stages. And uh, so in reality, then, what he finds is four plus one for the New Testament. He finds five periods of differing administrations of God. But you've got to be careful how you use those terms or it's going to appear like you just joined the other team. And your buddies aren't, aren't going to like you for that. So the covenant theologian finds biblical distinctions a necessary part of his theology, even though 
the covenant of grace is his ruling category. That's going to be his overarching thing that he'll keep coming back to again and again. Anyway, we uh, find, dispensationalists find his answer to the need for distinctions in his dispensational scheme, supply the need for distinctions in the orderly progress of revelation throughout scripture. We see not stages in the revelation of the covenant of grace, but God's distinctive and different administrations in directing the affairs of the world. So the church is, not only is it different from Israel, the design is different, the purpose is different, the function is different, the result is different, the, the conclusion is different, everything. I mean, all you've got to really realize is, you know what, the Jews had a stewardship whether they were saved or not. But our stewardship requires the born-again relationship in the body of Christ in order to be baptized in a personal union with, with Christ. Anyway, all interpreters feel the need for distinctions. So that doesn't prove that dispensationalist di distinctions are the correct ones, but it does demonstrate that the need for distinctions is basic to the proper interpretation of Scripture. Okay? I mean, for crying out loud, if, um, if, you, if you have a Christian that reads Genesis 6 and then decides that he's not going to go build an ark tomorrow, well, why not? Didn't God command you to build an ark and start pick, putting animals on there and preparing for a flood? No. God did not command you to build an ark because God commanded Noah to build an ark. Okay? That's not your, that's not your deal. So you have a distinction there. Anyway. Sometimes that, that approach can help as well. I do like these statements here. These are both, uh, Ryrie is not quoting Schaefer in this. There's some truth in the two statements. Any person is a dispensationalist who trusts in the blood of Christ rather than bringing an animal sacrifice. Okay? And I like that as a quote, but that's a quote that leads to abuse and it leads to the, uh, the opposition um, throwing in our face saying, aha, you think that the Old Testament believers got saved by bringing animal sacrifices? Which we don't. But still, it is not a feature of our faith stewardship to be bringing animals in to our worship. It was for them. It's not how they got saved, but it's what they did by faith in their worship. Also, uh, any person is a dispensationalist who observes the first day of the week rather than the seventh. Okay, what changed? Why is Sunday the Lord's Day? And why do, we, why do we observe the Lord's Day instead of the Sabbath Day? He had a third quote there too. Um, this is Lewis Berry Schaefer, Dispensationalism, page 9. And I linked it here to get the fuller quote. And also, he had a third middle statement too. Nope, that's not it. Trust the blood of Christ rather than bringing an animal sacrifice. Uh, observing the first day of the week rather than the seventh day of the week. Then he had a, uh, a third note as well. Why am I not finding it? Mm-mm-mm. Oh, you know what? How did I get there? Okay, I'm not hearing anybody today, so I apologize. Hopefully on Tuesday I'll get my new hearing aids. All right, well, let's skip that. I'm confusing my books here. All right. It's in the paragraph that begins, what men then, according to these def definitions, should be classed as dispensationalists. Number two is, any person is a dispensationalist who disclaims any right or title to the land which God covenanted to Israel for an everlasting inheritance. Is that what you were looking for? I couldn't hear you. Thank you, though. Anybody else heard me? Okay. 
One more time. It, it, it's in the, the quote I think you were looking for is in the paragraph that begins, what men then, according to these definitions, should be classed as dispensationalists? Number two is, any person is a dispensationalist who disclaims any right or title to the land which God covenanted to Israel for an everlasting inheritance. Okay, yes, that was the missing, that was the third part. Okay. What book were you reading from? That's Lewis Perry Chafer's Dispensationalism. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I thought I had a note there, but I'm not going to worry about it. All right, so that's one need. Another need is the philosophy of history. And uh, although the scriptures are not a philosophy of history, they do contain one. And, uh, and, and this approach whereby we understand that there is a destination, there is a goal, that it is unfolding one step, the next step, the next step, the next step. The angels were a part of that. The Gentiles were a part of that. Israel's a part of that. The church is a part of that. And it's progressing in that way for a reason, for a goal. And as we've been studying lately, the dispensation of the fullness of times is what the Father has in his goal because he never lost sight of that in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. So this need of a philosophy of history I think it is kind of interesting, some of the other details on this. I didn't put them in your quiz, I don't think. But it is, um, the covenant view sees the course of history as a struggle between good and evil until terminated at the beginning of eternity. And um, Alva McLean thought that it made it a very pessimistic worldview, um, contrasting it with a dispensational worldview. Now, Alva McLean is a dispensationalist, or he was during his lifetime. Um, part of your quiz is to be identifying some of these names as uh, putting a D for the next to the dispensationalist and an N next to the non-dispensationalist. And uh, most of these, a lot of these are dead now. So even if they used to be non-dispensationalist, they've, they've been corrected since then. They, they got to heaven and they learned. Um, Anyway, so stay tuned on some of these names. Here is the quote by uh, McLean viewing um, Covenant guys to be pretty pessimistic. Um, he says, it seems, such a view of history seems unduly pessimistic in the light of biblical revelation, as if this is just a waiting room, um, a preparatory vestibule of eternity. Anyway, interacting with some of those guys. Progressive dispensationalists take a both-and view of uh, of this, and then they're really blending the church with Israel. They say they're not, but they are. Uh, they are equating when Jesus ascended the Father, seated the Father's right hand, that seated the Father's right hand, okay, this is not my view, but this is the progressive dispensationalist view. When Jesus ascended and was seated at the Father's right hand, okay, that was the throne of David. And it still is the throne of David. And they have a conflation of the Father's right hand in heaven with the throne of David, which has never been in heaven, okay? And is waiting to be reseated once again on this earth. So uh, there's issues there. A second requirement of the philosophy of history is a proper unifying principle. And uh, I would agree with that. In the covenant theology, the principle is the covenant of grace. That's, that's, they hang their hat on that every time. They go back to that. That's the, that's the driving issue that everything else falls under, this covenant of grace. This is the alleged covenant that the Lord made with man after the sin of Adam. All right? And, you know, try to find it. It's not there. But they, it, theologically, it's, it's understood. It's implied. It's inferred. It's, it's understood that uh, this covenant of grace. And... Uh, they say it's, 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 it happened at the moment that he clothed them with the animal skins and he inaugurated this covenant of grace. But it's not spelled out that way in the text. Okay, so I always ask, I say, I always ask, show me this covenant of grace like I can show you the Noahic covenant and the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant. I can take you to, to 2 Samuel 7. I can walk you through the Davidic covenant. I can take you to Jeremiah 31. I can walk you through the, uh, the new covenant. Okay, microphone over there.
So just for, for, for clarification on that, are, are you suggesting you don't feel like it's alluded to anywhere or just literally not said? Like, you know, it's just... At best, there's an illusion, mm -hmm. but that illusion is not supported or developed in any, any real way, anywhere in the Bible. Okay. So it's not as if, though, like the Trinity, right? No, we're, there's no mention of the Trinity in the Bible. No, it's, it's, not, right. it's not a Trinity issue. Yeah. But it's alluded to in Scripture, and so we, we call it the Trinity, right? Uh, like yes. the term Trinity. And so the covenant of grace, though not specifically mentioned in Scripture, you would say if you found something that alluded to it and was supported by Scripture, then you don't have to have the term covenant grace or covenant of grace no. literally in Scripture. But my question is, if that's true, and I've never had a covenant guy satisfactorily respond to this, because I have Abrahamic, Noahic, Davidic, Mosaic, New, I have all of these other covenants that are literally there in very explicit ways. If something is as overarching, determinate, and controls my whole theological outlook as this covenant of grace, why does it seem to be the exception to the rule that I can't I can't point to a text like I can for the Davidic covenant, like I can for the New Covenant, like I can for the Abrahamic covenant. Would it be, as a follow-up, wouldn't it be fair to say that belief in the Trinity is even more overarching and fundamental to the Christian belief? And again, the term Trinity is not found in Scripture. But we hold to that doctrine. Oh, we do, yeah, yeah. Doctrine. As Trinitarians, sure. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, all right. All right, thank you. All right. Yes, sir. I have a follow-up question to his question because I was thinking the same question of like, well, <clears throat> you've mentioned in the past with other concepts like the Trinity <clears throat> that we were able to determine that um, categorically or um, contextually we understand there's a Trinity not because Scripture tells us there's a Trinity, but we understand and can reckon we, we – we, we, uh, Through deductive reasoning, deductive we find reasoning, yeah. the deity of the Father, the deity of the Son, the deity of the Holy Spirit. Right. And we have a comprehensive theological conclusion that we come to called Trinitarianism. Right. And you're saying that the reason with the grace, um, the covenant of grace, the reason why we don't hold to that is because there, there's no way we can um, deductively draw that out of the scriptures at all. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That was my question. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right, and then back row for Dan. Okay. All right. In dispensationalism, the overarching principle is doxological, the glory of God. Some, and this is where we don't do ourselves any favors, um, theological or eschatological or doxological. We'll pick one. Okay. Um, don't say the principle is, and then give me three options. Okay. Um, so this is one uh, realm where I think uh, the covenant guys will bash us to say, well, you don't have a unifying principle. I think we do have a unifying principle. And the best one I've ever seen is the one in the Plan of God ABC reader that says, God the Father has instituted a plan for the maximum glorification of Jesus Christ. And the theme, the dispensational theme, uh, the overarching principle is the magnification and glorification of Jesus Christ. But different dispensationalists will take it as doxological, the glory of God. The fundamental theme is the glory of God. And so Israel's plan is a part of God's glory. Our salvation is a part of God's glory. Uh, the angels are a part of God's glory. Uh, but God's plan is bigger than just saving us. That is part of it, clearly. Saving us is part of his plan, but he has a bigger plan than just a salvific purpose. Okay? And uh, whereas the covenant of grace seems to boil everything into a, into a, a, a salvation goal. Anyway, um, theological, eschatological, or doxological. In progressive dispensationalism, the unifying theme is Christological because of the emphasis on Christ in the Messianic Davidic kingdom already and yet not fulfilled. And so they almost take a real good step in the plan of God direction, but they don't. And... Uh, so they end up where they end up there. But to turn it Christological is actually closer to where um, the Bible puts it. All things are through, uh, from him, through him, and to him. That Jesus created all things, all things created through him and for him. Very, very important. Colossians chapter 1. If all things were created through him and for him, 
then he has to have center stage in whatever uh, doxological plan we're coming up with as, a, as an overall purpose. Only dispensationalism does justice to the proper concept of progressive revelation. Now, this is where James Orr comes in, and this is, this is a, a very useful portion of the book. Uh, because covenant theology includes in its system different modes of administration of the covenant of grace. These modes would give an appearance of an idea of progressiveness. In practice, there's extreme rigidity in covenant theology. And actually, they use the umbrella to go back and reinterpret everything else. So James Orr himself, a covenant theologian, criticizes the covenant system along this very line. And so I think it's useful. And I, I like this book. I like James Orr, the, uh, the Progress of Dogma, one of the earliest books I think I read in, uh, of a covenant uh, approach. He says, It failed to seize the true idea of development and by an artificial system of typology and allegorizing interpretation sought to read back practically the whole of the New Testament into the Old. Right? So if you're reading an Old Testament text and you're just insisting of just bringing the New Testament into it as if that's all it's saying, you're missing out on what it's saying and how it progresses to the New Testament. The most obvious defect was that in using the idea of the covenant as an exhaustive category and attempting to force into it the whole material of theology, it created an artificial scheme which could only repel minds desirous of simple and natural notions. Okay? And he's not wrong. This is actually a very valid criticism against his own school, against his own um, covenant theology. Because of the rigidity of its unifying principle of the covenant of grace, can never show within its system proper progress of revelation. Because you have to take everything back to that. And it boils down to that. And it's never taking you into anything else beyond. Dispensation gives the idea of development under various administrations of God. Different revelation was given to man. All right, Israel was not given what we were given. Israel was not given the mystery doctrine. Why not? Okay, what were they given? We weren't given the law. Why not? And so once you start asking those questions, and once you start dividing between Israel and the church, the Hebrew canon and the Greek canon, once you start dividing these things um, and, and keeping literal every step of the way, you will invariably come to the dispensational view. Are there similarities present? Sure. But are there differences? Those are the key, okay? So a correct philosophy of history, it's a, it's a benefit to the dispensational scheme. It provides consistent hermeneutics. This will be dealt with in chapter 5, okay? But we use the literal, plain, normal, or historical grammatical interpretation consistently. I think the reformers were great when they put their soteriology in these terms, but they failed to take it to the realm of eschatology. Covenant guys are well known for the use of non-literal interpretation, especially with prophecy, equally well known for amillennialism, which is only the natural outcome of such a hermeneutic. I mean, when the plain language says a thousand years, a thousand years, you know, six times in five verses, that gets your attention. And if you're going to say, oh, well, it's not really a thing, okay. What else is not really a thing? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Is that really a thing? You know, what are we doing with our hermeneutic? Do words mean things? So here's George Ladd. In order to add support to his post-tribulational view, this is where rapture and second advent are the same thing. So Jesus returns, and believers get transformed and caught up, meet the Lord in the air, at which point then we drop back down, and we just whoop everybody. And we win. I don't know why we even leave survivors, because any survivors are going to be sent to hell anyway, because they're unbelievers. And um, that's, that's the post-tribulational view, uh, rapture view. So, um, anyway, he's forced to regard the 144,000 as referring not to literal Israel, but to spiritual Israel, or the church. Even though they're delineated tribe by tribe by tribe by tribe, 12,000 in each tribe, that seems pretty specific to me. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, right? Where's the church in that? Okay, obviously it's not. Further, he cannot agree with the dispensationalist idea of the Jewish character of Matthew's gospel. Yeah, he's going to take issue with that. Lad, Lad would not like that. But he nowhere explains, for instance, how he can interpret in any normal way our Lord's words of commission to the twelve recorded in Matthew 10. 
And, and as I, this is an interesting conundrum, and I didn't think about this until recently. Matthew 10, when Jesus tells the, the disciples, don't go the way of the Gentiles, don't enter any Samaritan city, just go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, those are the instructions in Matthew chapter 10. And anyone who attempts to interpret plainly this commission forbade the disciples to go to the Gentiles. And then you go to the commission in Matthew 28, the same disciples being commanded, Peter, James, John, and all these knuckleheads, right? And now they're told to um, make disciples of all the nations. Well, wait a minute. So if that was then and this is now, what do we do? Well, what's going on? Okay. And so you either give up in confusion or resort to spiritualizing one of the passages or, or recognizing, hey, you know what? There's a dispensational distinction here. And it's, uh, it's a good thing where our theology doesn't force us to cram everything into a covenant of grace. So if plain or normal interpretation is the only valid hermeneutical principle, and we're going to see that it is. Okay, by the way, this is how Jesus interpreted when we see him preaching a sermon out of, out of Isaiah and it's recorded for us in Luke, all right, we see how he handled the scriptures, how he employed it is written for every temptation. We, we see, and we talked about this in Bibliology, that he had a higher view of scripture than today's liberals, clearly. Um, we realize that his hermeneutic, not just his, but every New Testament author, their use of the Old Testament uh, is, is where we derive our hermeneutic. That's why we're literal interpretationists, right? We, we believe there will be a future kingdom. Why? Because a virgin did conceive and bear a son, all right? And, and, and the first Advent prophecies were all fulfilled literally. Why are we going to take the second Advent prophecies figuratively? Why are we going to take this side, you know, the stuff that we like here, literally, and then these other things allegorically? I hinted a little bit this morning, and I should have done a little bit more, I was running out of time then. I have more time now. Um, but it's curious to me. This is, this is the, the Jewish approach to first and second advent. The Jewish approach to the suffering Messiah and the reigning Messiah. The Jewish approach to uh, Isaiah 53, for example, or other passages. That they, they, will, um, they will allegorize the suffering Messiah passages. But then they want to take the kingdom passages literally. Right? Because obviously, who, who doesn't want a real kingdom, a literal kingdom? So suffering, oh, well, that's just a, you know, anti-Semitism. Jews have been treated poorly, uh, and it's always been like that. So they, they can read a passage like Isaiah 53 and just allegorize it and say, well, it's symbolic. It represents uh, anti-Semitism and, and bad treatment of Jewish people, blah, 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 blah. So they will allegorize First Advent prophecies while they will love Second Advent prophecies and, and cheer on the kingdom and say, yes, here we go. And, and uh, so that's the approach there, right? The covenant guys flip it around. Non-dispensationalists flip it around. Whereby they'll take all the first advent, literally, virgin conceived, had a son, come humble, riding on a colt, entering into Jerusalem, the palm trees. The, I mean, all of the first advent prophecies they're fine with taking those literally. Kind of helps that we have the historical past to look back to there. But then the second Advent prophecies, that's where they go into the allegorical mode. That's when they decide that words don't really mean what they mean. A thousand years isn't really a thousand years. That's why they, uh, they, they have a preterist view of Revelation. That's why they have other things. Because they're assigning a different hermeneutic for their second Advent than they were willing to use for the, the first Advent. Happy with a literal first Advent, but they want to have a symbolic non-kingdom, non-all-millennial uh, uh, second half. Anyway, that's, that was just a thought I was tossing around in my mind this morning. I didn't quite, didn't quite get it out there. Real quick, uh, in regards to the two Matthew passages, uh -huh. um, so I, I, I tend to believe them both, right? And mm -hmm. so, uh, but I see it as... Matthew 5, the Matthew 5 passage, right? It was Matthew 5? Matthew 10. Oh, Matthew 10, I'm sorry. Um, as a fulfillment of, you know, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Micah's, you know, go to the lost sheep of Israel sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so Jesus is fulfilling that, right? That's, that's the fulfillment of that. And then in <coughs> that fulfillment, then it progresses to 
the nations. So is that not appropriate interpretation, you think? Or, I mean, it seems to, to just follow logically, like he's fulfilling the Old Testament passages and prophecies in regarding to the lost sheep of Israel. And then once that's, once, it, once it's fulfilled or once he at least does that initially and saying, okay, I've gone to the lost sheep of Israel first, Mm -hmm. and then goes out to all the nations. Yeah, I think the big difference, though, is that in Matthew 10, uh, he's not yet rejected. And so he hasn't passed that point where they're accusing him of, of uh, serving Satan and casting out demons by the power of Baals above. So he's not yet gone into the parable of the kingdom mode. He's not yet gone. And so clearly there's still the, uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand mm -hmm. that John the Baptist preached, that Jesus preached sending them out two by two like he did in Matthew 10 to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Even himself, when he uh, had his vacation in the, on the uh, Phoenician coast and the Syrophoenician woman came to him and he said, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Um, so that's all consistent with that while Jesus was still here. I think the difference is in uh, Matthew 28 now is that all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And now he's resurrected, now he's prepared to ascend, and now um, in his departure, this next commission, um, if this one's the great commission, what was that other one? Was that like a mediocre commission? Or what was the... <laughs> a fulfillment well, commission? Yeah, what was the Matthew 10 commission? Well, this one's the great commission, somebody told me. Okay, and so that one must be not so great, the mediocre commission or something. But, um, but yeah, uh, to make disciples of all the nations, and then in Acts 1 when he says, from Jerusalem to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. So obviously there's a global uh, duty that uh, the disciples are being given here. And, and that's, you know, sadly, it's, it's the impact that Israel should have had in their stewardship now is given for what the church will have in, uh, in our stewardship as far as our disciple makers' uh, obligation is concerned. Okay. Does that make sense? I, I, I guess... Part of what I'm getting at is I, I believe both of them, and I still believe that the church is, in a, in a certain sense, a fulfillment of Israel, right? Like that they fulfill, right? They don't replace, but they fulfill. And so when you progress from Jesus sending out those initially to ensure that the prophetic, you know, prophetic words that were given through Ezekiel, Micah, and, and uh, Jeremiah are fulfilled, and then moves on to, you know, now go out to all the nations, I see that as a progression of revelation. Ah, okay. We'll explore that a, I guess. I mean, a different day. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe on Tuesday I'll, hear th I'll be hearing things better. So that, that commandment would be a secondary application as well. Uh, this is delivered to the disciples prior to the day of Pentecost. It was not spoken in the church age. But Jesus is not here on the day of Pentecost in the church age. He ascends 10 days before the church age begins. And so um, it's, it is given to the, to the 12. It is given to the disciples that will become the apostles of the church age. So I don't have a problem taking this as a... And it was written, you know, 10 years after the church age began when the Gospel of Matthew was written. So I don't have an issue in, in taking this as a, as a primary church text like I do with Luke uh, or with Matthew or John 13 through 17. Upper room discourse. I'm fine with the upper room discourse being primarily... Ecclesiastic, and then uh, Sermon on the Mount being primarily Israel, and um, church secondary. Uh, all of it discourse, primarily Israel. Um, but Great Commission I do take as primarily church. Okay. Um, do, do you happen to have a themes dictionary on Logos? I do. Would you be able to look up uh, New Covenants real quick? Ooh, that'll take us past our hour. No, no, no. But no, I can do that. <laughs> so I'm looking at the watch. I just have a, a, a question there. So you New have covenants, two. plural. Notice. Right. You got so, that from Schaefer. So he's got two, right? Two uh, subcategories. Uh -huh. One, new covenant to Israel. The other one, new covenants to the church. Uh -huh. um, I've heard you say that we, uh, the church doesn't have any covenants. So if you read through those two real quick, um, with Will you say that those two subcategories, the, the new covenant to Israel and the new covenant to the church, is, is actually just the second one would be just like the first one? If you go scroll up a little bit. 
so you see new covenant to Israel under new covenants. Uh huh. And then you see, that's number one. And then number two says new covenant to the church. But um, but it's actually the second one would be new covenant yeah, to this Israel. Is, this is not the approach I would take with, right. with new covenant. So the second one would actually be the new covenant to Israel as well instead of to the church. No. No? No, the, the new covenant to the church is... No, nothing that's, that God has designed for church-age believers has anything to do with Israel and their new covenant. Because it says right there, uh, cup which is poured out for you, his substitutionary sacrifice on the cross is the new covenant in my blood. So that covenant, new covenant, what's it referring to? Israel. That's what I'm saying. Uh -huh. So that, so the number two, if it was your dictionary, that's why I guess, and you had new covenants, you would have those two subcategories as one, new covenant to Israel. Right? The second one would be... I would just delete it. The whole thing? Uh-huh. And what would you do with a new covenant in my blood? What is that? Apply to Israel in well, the future. That's what I'm saying. So you would just, you wouldn't erase the whole n number two. Yes. You would, um, well, I guess I, you're not, I, I'm, I'm with you, but I'm, I, I, don't know, I don't know if you're understanding what I'm saying. I don't. I don't hear very well today. And I'm so the new covenant to the church, what he has. There is no new covenant to the church. That's what I'm saying. Yes. You would put it under Israel. I would not have the, an entry in my, in the Bolander Theological Dictionary of whatever, Themes Bible Doctrine Dictionary. Um, my version of this Bible Doctrine Dictionary would not have a new covenant for the church. Right, right. The, so the new covenant in my blood would be under Israel. Yes. Okay. That's what I was saying. Okay. So right there <coughs> on the uh, Themes Bible Dictionary, definition number two that, that he was talking about, uh -huh. <coughs> excuse me, it, it says the second definition is new covenant to the church is the sum of total, sum total of God's gracious, unique promises and provisions for believers in the church age. Are you, are you saying you disagree with that statement? For, for Okay, so where did Theme get that idea from? Ask him. He's dead. <laughs> All right. All right, this is the conclusion then. Dispensationalism claims to be a help, and I agree it is a help, in supplying the answers to the need for biblical distinctions. I think it helps so much greater than the covenant alternatives uh, in distinctions between Israel and the church, law and grace, Old Testament, New Testament. Um, offering a satisfying philo philosophy of history, employing a consistently normal principle of interpretation, Basic areas in proper understanding of the Bible. If dispensationalism has the answers, then it is most helpful tool in consistent biblical interpretation. If not, it ought to be minimized or discarded. If it's not helpful, why, why are we using it? Okay? And I don't think it's helpful to view anything of, of the New Covenant in any connection to the church. So, discard it. If it's not helpful, discard it. All right, let me uh, come back to, I got your quiz ready to go, and then I lost my, uh, I lost my notes. Let me pull this up again. Load my Sunday Ryrie workspace. There we go. All right, so for next week, you're going to read chapter two. It's 22 pages of reading from page 27 to 48. It's a great chapter, by the way. Uh, we'll just keep working our way through chapter by chapter each week. If, uh, if we give you a week off, we'll let you know. There's only going to be one between now and May that we're taking off, and that's, uh, that's April 14th. All right, and I do have paper copies of your quizzes here. Uh, when I get home, I'll put a PDF uh, on the, in the group so you can get the PDF there. Any final questions? Okay. Yes. Hey, so I, would, I have a question. So that... that that last thing I was 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 Colonel Theme. He was not a was he a he wasn't a covenant theologian, was he? No, 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 no. He was he was a card carrying dispensationalist. Great guy. Right. Okay. I, I feel like I have ninety five percent agreement with anything Colonel Theme ever taught. It's right. just the five percent where we're not really. Those are the things that I get a lot of questions about. Do you think that maybe he just mislabeled the blessings that the church gets? Because we have our own separate blessings. Do you think he was just calling it no, no. So, the grace so, covenant? No, no, no. So um, 
it's, it's very common. There's a, there's a book by Mike Stollard talking about four views of the New Covenant. And, um, I mean, it's an issue that's been around for 2,000 years, right? How does the church relate to the New Covenant? Why is the New Covenant mentioned in the communion service of the Gospels? Why is it mentioned in Paul's quotation in 1 Corinthians chapter 11? Why are we called servants of the New Covenant in 2 Corinthians chapter 3? Uh, the various references in the book of Hebrews to the New Covenant. Um, all of those passages has led to Christians, non-dispensationalists, uh, is feeding their uh, understanding of the church replacing Israel. But dispensationalists have not answered that very well in many cases. And so they found different ways to attempt to answer that. And Schaefer's method was to, to create two new covenants, one for Israel still and, a, and another new covenant for the church. And that's the pattern that, that Theme was following on that. And I don't know anybody outside of Schaefer and Theme that teach the two new covenant views. So that's one way. Uh, another way to approach it is to say, well, the literal new covenant is still future. It will be given to Israel in the second advent, but the spiritual components of that covenant are given to the church today. So we have spiritual blessings of the new covenant, even though we don't have the future earthly benefits of the, of the new covenant, and which a lot of folks hold that view. Okay, which I can't find other than my sins are forgiven. What else is there as, as a spiritual benefit? Is the law written on my heart? Do I not need teachers anymore? Okay, because Jeremiah 31 says they won't need teachers anymore. They will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. So if that's a spiritual benefit I have, why do we, why do we still have teachers today? Why do we have pastor teachers today? Okay. Um, then, of course, the replacement crowd says it's all for us. God's done with Israel, so the new covenant is now ours, and you know they can drop dead. Um, that's replacement theology, um, or my view, which is, I guess the fourth view now, is that the new covenant is entirely for Israel, it's entirely future, and the church has no part of it, because we are in Christ, Christ is the mediator, and we are the servants. And our servant capacity, by the way, doesn't even start until his mediation starts, which is second advent. So he's the mediator now, but he's not mediating yet, because he hasn't put that covenant into place yet. It doesn't come about until after these things. Jeremiah, and so it's after the tribulation that the new covenant is then given. So um, when he starts mediating at his second advent, we will start ministering because he's the mediator and we're the ministers in him. And so we view the, the, the new covenant as entirely Israel, entirely future, and not related to the church presently. Thank you. That really helped. <laughs> All right. And I do recommend uh, Stollard's book, and I recommend, uh, even better, I think Christopher Cohn has a, has a great book on, on the New Covenant called Introduction to the New Covenant. And it's, um, it's got good chapters in there from George Gunn and from oh, his son David Gunn and, and several others that, that wrote different, different chapters there. It's, I think that's more readable than the Stollard book, but they're both excellent. All right. Anything else? I'm still opposed to polygamy. I'm not pro-slavery. What else? Find something controversial, would you? That okay, question from the desk, question from Ruben. Okay. Um, I guess in regards to the, uh, we were talking earlier about the terminology of like co great covenant of grace and it not being in scripture and then like really finding anything, whether, whether we can find anything or not that alludes to it. Um, and I, I would say it's debatable, right? I feel like I find sufficient to conclude that there's a covenant of grace, uh -huh. but just using like direct terminology, the term dispensation, right? You have what the the term administration used once in economy uh, yeah but i mean it's it's technically it's used one time right the uh, for in in what is it ephesians i think it's used three times specifically referencing an age or an economy like we use it Got, okay 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 so three times yeah um whereas covenant I mean, it's used, what, hundreds, uh, 200 and, yeah. 200 and something, 290 times. Yeah. And so it, on that basis, I would say, would you agree that to see 
dispensationalism and the rest of scripture, you have to extrapolate a lot. Like from scripture and allude, you have a lot of allusions because you don't find the term dispensation as pervasively through scripture as you do the, the term covenant. Right. So if you and can I would make, say you would find covenant in the Hebrew canon far more often and yes. dispensation in the Greek canon. Yeah, I would agree right. with that. Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to figure out is if, if it's, if you can make the jump from not necessarily seeing the term dispensation so much in, in scripture, but understanding dispensationalism in scripture, and you don't seem to have any issue with that. It seems, on the other hand, it's really difficult for you to just uh, say that the covenant of grace, even though it's not technically spelled out, you know, it's, it's not, if it's not technically spelled out, then it's likely not, not there, doesn't exist, right? And it just seems like a bigger jump to do the dispensationalism por portion oh, no, 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 no. than it does the, the covenant of grace. Just the opposite, because where that analogy fails is that we have all, every reference to the Abrahamic covenant, mm -hmm. explicit. Every reference to the Davidic covenant, explicit. Every reference to Mosaic law, explicit. Every reference to uh, new covenant, explicit. And so they're all explicitly spelled out, which is why we have hundreds and hundreds of diatheke or barish, uh, barishith, uh, uh, or mm -hmm. barith Baris, covenants, yeah. right? And so we have all of those, but we don't have the grace, the covenant yeah. of grace. But we don't the, have, or the covenant of works, or we, the we don't have the stewardships spelled out like that, right? Not, not like the covenants. Like it does, you know, like with the covenants, it's, it's your, you go into something and it says covenant, you know, like, uh, like it was covenant with Abraham and Moses. Oh, but we do. And that's next week. And okay. that's in chapter two and chapter three. Okay. Yeah. Right. So the, 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 the dispensation of grace is, is where we are today in the church age. And the dispensation of the fullness of time is where we're headed after the millennium. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right. Was there something at the desk? All right. We'll close with that and then I'll close in prayer. And again, I apologize for not hearing what you're all saying today. I'm hoping after Tuesday I'll be hearing better. It's okay. We can turn it up. <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. So have you said that after the church, the bride of Christ is raptured, that then it occurs the marriage supper of the lamb? Is that when the marriage supper of the lamb happens in yes, between after, that well, and Christ returning, you know, with us for the beginning of the second advent? Well, so my question is, in the millennium, you said we're, sla we're slaves and we have you know, work to do there, but how does that relate to us being the bride of Christ? Being s servants or slaves and the bride of Christ in the millennium. Can I talk to you after class? Yes. Okay. I will hear you better. Oh, okay. Thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your grace and faithfulness. I thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Austin Bible Church is a grace ministry. No price is ever assigned to any video, audio, printed material or anything provided by this ministry. Costs associated with such grace provision are paid in full by grace-oriented, born-again believers in Jesus Christ, motivated by God the Holy Spirit, well-pleasing to God the Father. More information on our grace-giving policy and your opportunity to join in this Grace Financial Fellowship can be found at the link in the description below.